Chapter One What Sammy Sings with the Birds. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What Sammy Sings with the Birds by Johanna Spirey. Translated by Helen B. Dole. Chapter First Old Marianne. For three days the spring sun had been shining out of a clear sky and casting a gleaming golden coverlet over the blue waters of Lake Geneva. Storm and rain had ceased. The breeze murmured softly and pleasantly up in the ash trees, and all around in the green fields the yellow buttercups and snow-white daisies glistened in the bright sunshine. Under the ash trees the clear brook was running with the cool mountain water and feeding the gaily nodding primroses and pink anemones on the hillside as they grew and bloomed down close to the water. On the low wall by the brook, in the shadow of the ash trees, an old woman was sitting. She was called Old Mary Ann throughout the whole neighborhood. Her big basket, the weight of which had become a little heavy, she had put down beside her. She was on her way back from Latour, the little old town with the vine-covered church tower, and the ruined castle, the high turrets of which rose far across the blue lake. Old Marianne had taken her work there. This consisted in all kinds of mending, which did not need to be done particularly well, for the woman was no longer able to do fine work, and never could do it. Old Marianne had had a very changeable life. The place where she now found herself was not her home. The language of the country was not her own. From the shady seat on the low wall she now looked contentedly at the sunny fields, then across the murmuring brook to the hillside, where the big yellow primroses nodded, while the birds piped and sang in the green ash trees above her, as if they had the greatest festival to celebrate. Every spring people think it never was so beautiful before, when they have already seen so many, she now said half aloud to herself. And as she gazed at the field so rich in flowers, many of the past years rose up and passed before her with all that she had experienced in them. As a child she had lived far beyond the mountains. She knew so well how it must look over there now at her father's house, which stood in a field among white blooming pear trees. Over yonder the large village, with its many houses, could be seen. It was called Zweisimen. Everybody called their house the sergeant's house, although her father quite peacefully tilled his fields. But that came from her grandfather. When quite a young fellow, he had gone over the mountains to Lake Geneva, and then still farther to Savoy, under a duke of Savoy he had taken part in all sorts of military expeditions, and had not returned home until he was an old man. He always wore an old uniform and allowed himself to be called sergeant. Then he married, and Marianne's father was his only child. The old man lived to be a hundred years old, and every child in all the region round knew the old sergeant. Marianne had three brothers— but as soon as one of them grew up he disappeared. She knew not where. Only this much she understood, that her mother mourned over them. But her father said quite resignedly every time, We can't help it. They will go over the mountains. They take it from their grandfather. She had never heard anything more about her brothers. When Mary Ann grew up and married, her young husband also came into the house among the pear trees for her father was old and could no longer do his work alone. But after a few years, Marianne buried her young husband. A burning fever had taken him off. Then came hard times for the widow. She had her child, little Sammy, to care for, besides her old, infirm parents to look after. And moreover, there was all the work to be done in the house and in the fields, which until now her husband had attended to. She did what she could, but it was of no use. The land had to be given up to a cousin. The house was mortgaged, and Marianne hardly knew how to keep her old parents from want. Gradually young Sammy grew up, 
and was able to help the cousin in the fields. Then the old parents died about the same time, and Mary Ann hoped now by hard work and her son's help little by little to pay up her debts and once more take possession of her fields and house. But as soon as her father and mother were buried, her son Sammy, who was now eighteen years old, came to her and said he could no longer bear to stay at home. He must go over the mountains, and so begin a new life. This was a great shock to the mother. But when she saw that persuasion, remonstrance, and entreaty were all in vain, her father's words came to her mind, and she said resignedly, "'It can't be helped. He takes it from his great-grandfather. But she would not let the young man go away alone, and he was glad to have his mother go with him. So she wandered with him over the mountains. In the little village of Chiley, which lies high up on the mountain slope, and looks down on the meadows rich in flowers, and the blue Lake Geneva, they found work with the jolly wine-grower Malone. This man, with curly hair already turning gray and a kindly round face, lived alone with his son in the only house left standing near a crooked maple tree. Mary Ann received a room for herself and was to keep house for Herr Malon and keep everything in order for him and his son. Sammy was to work for good pay in Malon's beautiful vineyard. The widow, Mary Ann, passed several years here in a more peaceful way than she had ever known before. When the fourth summer came to an end, Sammy said to her one day, "'Mother, I must really marry young Marietta of St. Legier, for I am so lonely away from her.' His mother knew Marietta well, and besides she liked the pretty clever girl, for she was not only always happy, but there were few girls so good and industrious. So she rejoiced with her son although she would have to go away from her to live with Marietta and her aged father in St. Legier, for she was indispensable to him. Herr Malon's son also brought a young wife home, and so Mary Ann had no more duties there, and had to look out for herself. She kept her room for a small rent, and was able to earn enough to support herself. She now knew many people in the neighborhood, and obtained enough work. Mary Ann pondered over all these things, and when her thoughts returned from the distant past to the present moment, and she still heard the birds above her singing and rejoicing untiringly, she said to herself, They always sing the same song, and we should be able to sing with them. Only trust in the dear Lord. He always helps us, although we may often think there is no possible way. Then Mary Ann left the low wall, took her basket up again on her arm, and went through the fragrant meadows of Burrier up towards Chiley. From time to time she cast an anxious look in the direction of St. Legier. She knew that young Marietta was lying sick up there, and that her son Sammy would now have hard work and care, for a much smaller Sammy had just come into the world. Tomorrow Mary Ann would go over and see how things were going with her son, and if she ought to stay with him and help. Mary Ann had scarcely stepped into her little room and put on her house dress to prepare her supper when she heard someone coming along with hurried footsteps. The door was quickly thrown open, and in stepped her son Sammy with a very distressed face. Under his arm he carried a bundle wrapped up in one of Marietta's aprons. This he laid on the table, threw himself down, and sobbed aloud with his head in his arms. It is all over, mother, all over. Marietta is dead. Oh, for heaven's sake, what are you saying? cried his mother in the greatest horror. Oh, Sammy, is it possible? Then she lifted Sammy gently and continued in a trembling voice. Come, sit down beside me and tell me all about it. Is she really dead? Oh, when did it happen? How did it come so quickly? Sammy willingly dropped down on a chair beside his mother, but then he buried his face in his hands and went on sobbing again. Oh, I can't bear it. I must go away, mother. I can't bear it here any longer. It is all over. Oh, Sammy, where would you go? said his mother, weeping. 
we have already come over the mountains where would you go from here i must go across the water as far as i possibly can i can't stay here any longer i cannot mother declared sammy i must go across the great water as far as possible oh not that cried mary ann don't be so rash wait a little until you can think more calmly and it will seem different to you no mother no i must go away i am forced to it i can't do any different cried sammy almost wild his mother looked at him in terror but she said nothing more she seemed to hear her father saying it can't be helped he takes it from his grandfather and with a sigh she said it will have to be so then there sounded from the bundle a strange peeping exactly as if a chicken were smothering inside what have you put in the bundle sammy asked the mother going towards it to loosen the firmly tied apron that's so i had almost forgotten it mother replied sammy wiping his eyes i have brought the little boy to you i don't know what to do with it oh how could you pack him up so yes yes you poor little thing said the grandmother soothingly taking the diminutive sammy out of one wrapping and then a second and a third the father sammy had wrapped the little baby first in its clothes then in a shawl and then in the apron as tight as possible so that it couldn't slip out on the way and fall on the ground when little sammy was freed from the smothering wrappings and could move his arms and legs he fought with all his limbs in the air and screamed so pitifully that his grandmother thought it seemed exactly as if he already knew what a great misfortune had come to him but father sammy said perhaps he was hungry for since the evening before no one had paid any attention to the little baby this seemed to the sympathetic marianne quite too cruel and she realized that if she didn't care for the poor little mite it would die she wrapped him up again carefully in his blanket but not around his head and carried him upright on her arm not under it as one carries a bundle then she ran all around her room to collect milk a dish and fire together so that the starving little creature might have some nourishment as she sat on her stool and the little one eagerly sipped the milk while his tiny little hand tightly clasped his grandmother's forefinger like a life preserver she said greatly touched yes indeed you little sammy you poor little orphan i will do what i can for you and the dear lord will not forsake us and to the big sammy she said i will keep him but don't take any rash steps in the first great sorrow many a one does what he later regrets see you can't run away from sorrow it runs with you stay and bear what the dear lord sends he is not angry with you hold to him still in time of sorrow then the sun will shine to-morrow it will be the same with you as it has been with so many others sammy had listened in silence but like one who does not understand what he hears good night mother may god reward you for what you do for the boy he said then after wiping his eyes again then he pressed his mother's hand and went out of the door end of chapter one Chapter Two of What Sammy Sings with the Birds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What Sammy Sings with the Birds by Johanna Spirey. Chapter Second At the Grandmother's. Old Mary Ann had now to begin over again, where she had left off twenty one years before, to bring up a little Sammy. But then she was fresh and strong she had her husband by her side and lived at home among friends and acquaintances now she was out in a strange land and was a worn-out woman and felt that her strength would not last much longer but little sammy did not realize all this he was tended and cared for as if his grandmother wanted to make up to him every moment for what he had lost and she was always saying to him pityingly you poor little thing 
you have nobody in the world now but an old grandmother moreover it was so father sammy could not be consoled as soon as his young wife was buried he went away and must have landed a long time ago in the far-away country little sammy grew finely and as his grandmother talked with him a great deal he began very early to imitate her his words became more and more distinct and when the end of his second year came he talked very plainly and in whole sentences his grandmother didn't know what to do for joy when she realized that her little sammy spoke not a word of french but pure swiss german as she had heard it only in her native land he spoke exactly like his grandmother who was indeed the only one he had to talk with now every day her baby gave her a new surprise first he began to say after her the little prayer she repeated for him morning and evening then he had said it all alone she had to weep for joy when the little one began to sing after the little summer song she had learned in her own childhood and had always sung to him and one day suddenly knew the whole song from beginning to end and sang one verse after another without hesitation in spite of all the grandmother's trouble and work the years passed so quickly to her that one day when she began to reckon she discovered that sammy must be fully seven years old then she thought it was really time that he learned something but suddenly to send the boy to a french school when he didn't understand a word of french seemed dreadful to her for he would be as helpless as a chicken in water she would rather try as well as she possibly could to teach him herself to read she thought it would be very hard but it went quite easily in a short time the youngster knew all his letters and could even put words together quite well that something could be made out of this which he could understand and which he did not know before was very amusing to him and he sat over his reading book with great eagerness but to go out with his grandmother to deliver her mending and to get new work was a still greater pleasure to him for nothing pleased him better than roaming through the green meadows then stopping at the brook to listen to the birds singing up in the ash trees the changeable april days had just come to an end and the beaming may sun shone so warm and alluring that all the flowers looked up to it with wide open petals mary ann with sammy by her hand her big basket on her arm was coming along up from latour the boy opened both his eyes as wide as he could for the red and blue flowers in the green grass and the golden sunshine above them delighted him very much grandmother he said taking a deep breath to-day we will sit on the low wall for twelve long hours won't we really yes indeed assented his grandmother we will stay there long enough to get well rested and enjoy ourselves but when the sun goes down and it grows dark then we will go then all the little birds are silent in the trees and the old night owl begins to hoot this seemed right for sammy for he didn't want to hear the old owl hoot now they had reached the wall a cool shadow was lying on it below the fresh brook murmured and up in the ash trees the birds piped and sang merrily together and one kept singing very distinctly sing too sing too sammy listened suddenly he lifted up his voice and sang as loud and lustily as the birds above and the whole song that his grandmother had taught him last night summer breezes blew all the flowers awake anew open wide their eyes to see nodding bowing in their glee all the merry birds we hear greet the sunshine bright and clear see them flitting through the sky singing low and singing high flowers in summer warmth delight what of winter and its blight snowy fields and forests cold flowers are by their faith consoled songsters all so blithe and gay know ye what your carols say then sammy listened very attentively as if he wanted to hear whether the birds really sang so listen listen grandmother he said after a while up there in the tree is one that doesn't sing like the others at first he keeps singing trust 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 and then the rest comes after yes yes that is the finch sammy she replied see he wants to impress it upon you so that you will think about what will always keep you safe and happy just listen now he is calling again trust 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 only trust the dear lord sammy listened again 
it was really wonderful how the finch always sounded above the other birds with his emphatic trust 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 you must never forget what the finch calls continued the grandmother see sammy perhaps i cannot stay with you much longer and then you will have no one else and will have to make your way alone then the little bird's song can oftentimes be a comfort to you so don't forget it and promise me too that you will say your little prayer every day so that you will be god-fearing then no matter what happens it will be well with you sammy promised that he would never forget to pray then he became thoughtful and asked somewhat timidly must i always be afraid grandmother no no did you think so because i said god-fearing it doesn't mean that i will explain it to you as well as i can you see to be god-fearing is when one has the dear lord before his eyes in everything he does and fears and hesitates to do what is not pleasing to him everything that is wicked and wrong whoever lives so before him has no reason to fear what may happen to him for such a man has the dear lord's help everywhere and if he has to meet hardship oftentimes he knows that the dear lord allows it so in order that some good may come out of it for him and then he can sing as happily as the little birds only trust the dear lord will you remember that well sammy yes i will said sammy decidedly for this pleased him much better than if he had to be always afraid now the setting sun cast its last long rays across the meadows and disappeared the grandmother left the wall took sammy by the hand and then the two wandered in the rosy twilight along the meadow path then up the Chapter Three, What Sammy Sings with the Birds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What Sammy Sings with the Birds, by Johanna Spirey. Chapter Third, Another Life. One morning, a few days later, Marianne was so tired she couldn't get up. Sammy sat beside her, waiting for her to be fully awake in order to go into the kitchen and make the coffee his grandmother opened her eyes once and fell asleep again she had never done anything like this before now she was really awake she tried to raise herself up a little then took sammy by the hand and said in a low voice sammy listen to me i must tell you something see when i am no longer with you I have no one else here, and are an entire stranger. But there, over the mountains, you have relatives, and you must return to them. Melon will tell you how to get there. You must go to Zweisimen. There ask for the sergeant, your cousin, who lives in the house with the big pear trees near it. Tell him your grandmother was the sergeant's Mary Ann and your father was Sammy. Work hard and willingly, and you will have to earn your living. There in the chest is some money in the little bag. Take it. It is yours. Don't spend it foolishly. Sammy, think of what you promised me. Don't neglect to pray. It will bring you comfort and happiness, which you will need. Try to associate with god-fearing people and live with them then you will learn only good go now sammy and call Herr milan i must talk with him sammy went and came back with the man of the house he stepped up to mary ann's bed and tried to encourage her as that was his way but he was alarmed at her appearance and wanted to go for the doctor as he told her but she held him fast and tried with great difficulty to express herself in his language for she had only a scanty knowledge of it milan nodded his head understandingly and then hurried away when he returned to the room a couple of hours later with the doctor sammy was still sitting in the same place by the bed waiting very quietly for his grandmother to wake up again 
the doctor drew near the bed then spoke with milan a while and finally came to sammy he told him his grandmother would never wake again that she was dead milan was a good man he said he himself would go with sammy part of the way until he found some one who could talk with him and take him further but he must put all his belongings together in a bundle then the two men went away after a while the young woman of the house came for the forsaken boy had deeply aroused her sympathy she found sammy still sitting in the same place by the bed he was looking steadfastly at his grandmother and weeping piteously the woman spoke to him but he did not understand her then she took everything out of the cupboard and drawers packed them into a bundle and showed sammy that he was to eat the bread and milk on the table sammy swallowed the milk obediently but the woman put the bread in his pocket then she led the boy once more to the bed that he might take his grandmother's hand in farewell sammy obeyed still sobbing and let himself be led away by the woman Herr Milan was already waiting beside his little cart in which lay Sammy's bundle. The boy understood that he was to draw the cart, but he knew not where. He wept softly to himself, for it seemed to him as if he were going out into the wilderness where he would be wholly alone. Milan went on ahead of him. It was the same way Sammy had often gone with his grandmother down to Latour. When he came to the wall by the brook, he sobbed aloud. How lovely it had been there with his grandmother. He could not see the way because of his falling tears, but he heard Herr Milan's heavy step in front of him, and he followed after. At the little station house, above the vine-covered church, Milan stopped. Soon after, the train came puffing along. Milan got in and pulled Sammy after him, and they started away. Sammy crouched in a corner and did not stir. They traveled thus for an hour. Sammy did not understand a word that was spoken around him, although several times one and another tried to talk with him a little, for the softly weeping boy had indeed awakened their sympathy. The train stopped again. Milan got out, and Sammy followed him. They went a short distance together, and then Milan stepped to the left into a large garden, and then into the house. Here he talked a while with the man of the house, who from time to time looked pityingly at Sammy. Then Milan took Sammy's hand, shook it, and left him behind alone in the big room. After some time the man of the house came back, and a sturdy fellow behind him, the latter began to talk in Sammy's own language. He wanted to console the boy, and said he would soon go on in a carriage. Then Sammy asked if he was his cousin, and if this was the village of Swaysimen. But the fellow laughed loudly, and said he was no cousin, but a servant here in the inn, and the place was called Aigel. Sammy would have to travel an hour longer, and would not reach Swaysimen before twelve o'clock at night but there was a coachman here from interlaken who had to go back and would take him along the man of the house had bread and eggs brought for sammy and when he said he wasn't hungry he put everything kindly into the boy's pocket then he led the boy out outside stood a large coach with two horses and high up on the top sat the driver no one was inside Sammy was lifted up, the driver placed him next to himself, and drove away. At any other time this would have pleased Sammy very much, but now he was too sad. He kept thinking of his grandmother, who could no longer talk with him, and would never wake again. After some time the driver began to talk to him. Sammy had to tell him where he came from and to whom he was going. He told him everything how he had lived with his grandmother, how she had fallen asleep early that day and did not wake up again, and that he was going to find a cousin in Swaysimen and would have to live with him. Sammy's childish description touched the driver so deeply that he finally said, 
It will be too late when we reach there. You must stay with me tonight. Then, when he saw Sammy's eyes close with the approaching twilight, and only open again when they went over a stone, and the two of them up on the box were jounced almost dangerously against each other, he grasped the boy firmly, lifted him up, and slipped him backwards into the coach. Here he fell at once fast asleep, and when he finally opened his eyes again, the sun was shining brightly in his face. He was lying in his clothes on a huge big bed in a room with white walls. In all his life he had never seen such walls. He looked around in consternation. Then the coachman of the day before came in the door. "'Have you had your sleep out?' he said, laughing. "'Come and have some coffee with me. Then I will take you to your cousin. Someone else must carry your bundle. It is too heavy for you.' Sammy followed him into the coffee room. Here the good man kept pouring out coffee for the boy, but Sammy could neither eat nor drink. When the coachman had finished his breakfast, he rose and started with Sammy on the way to the sergeant's house. It was not far. At the house in the meadow among the pear trees he laid Sammy's bundle down, shook him by the hand, and said, "'Well, good luck to you. I have nothing to do in there, and have farther to go.' Sammy thanked him for all his kindness, and gazed after his benefactor, until he disappeared behind the trees. Then he knocked on the door. A woman came out, looked in amazement first at the boy, then at his big bundle, and said rudely, "'Where have you come from with all your household goods?' Sammy informed her where he had come from, and that his grandmother was Mary Ann, and his father Sammy." Meanwhile, three boys had come running up to them, placed themselves directly in front of him, and were looking at him from top to toe with wide open eyes. This embarrassed Sammy exceedingly. "'Bring your father out,' said the mother to one of her boys. Their father was sitting inside at the table, eating his breakfast. "'What's the matter now?' he growled. "'There is someone here who claims to be a relative of yours.' "'He doesn't know where he is going,' exclaimed his wife. "'He can come in to me. Perhaps I can tell him if I know,' replied the man, without moving. "'Well, go in,' directed the woman, giving Sammy an assisting push. The boy went in and replied very timidly where he had come from and to whom he had belonged. The peasant scratched his head. "'Make quick work of it,' said the woman impatiently, who had followed with her three boys. "'I think we have enough with the three of them, and there are people who might need such a boy.' "'This is quickly decided,' said the peasant thoughtfully, cutting his piece of bread in two. "'Send all four boys out.' After this command had been carried out, he continued slowly, "'There is no help for it. It was stipulated at the time the house was sold that room must be made in the house if either mary ann sammy or the child should come back besides it is not so bad as it seems where three sleep together there is room for a fourth and he can do some work for his food the parish can do something for his clothes his wife had no desire to have a fourth added to her three boys for her own made enough noise and trouble for her she protested, saying she knew how it was with such stray children, and they could expect to have a fine time. But it was of no use. It was decided that Sammy should have a place in the house. The farmer brought in the bundle and carried it up to the oldest boy's room, where until now the broad-shouldered Stophy had slept in a bed alone. He could take Sammy in with him, for he was smaller than the other two. Michael and Uli could stay together as before. Then the woman opened the bundle. She was not a little surprised when she found inside not only Sammy's clothes, all in the best of order, but also two good dresses, aprons, and neckerchiefs. She called Sammy up to her and showed him the corner in the chest where she had put his things. Then she said she would take the woman's clothes for herself, since he could surely make no use of them. 
the clothes which his grandmother had always worn were so dear to sammy that he looked on with sad eyes as they were carried away but he thought it had to be so he had already made the acquaintance of the three boys they had shown him below in front of the house how one of them could best throw down the others and had demonstrated all sorts of useful tricks but as each tried to outdo the others in showing off his knowledge a struggle ensued and the tricks were immediately applied one threw another over the third sammy was knocked and thrown around by all three when he now came down from his room a voice from the barn called out come here and help pull sammy ran along there stood the two younger boys michael and uli with great hoes on their shoulders and stophy beside a cart which had to be taken along they waited for their father and then all went out to the field here stophy and sammy had to rake together the grass which the father cut and loaded on the cart and bring home to the cows michael and uli had to hoe the weeds in the next field nearby now it appeared that sammy did not know at all how to use the rake for he had never done such work he shall weed with uli and michael can do this work said the farmer but when sammy tried to do this the hoe was too heavy for him and he could do nothing then kneel on the ground and pull them up with your hands said the farmer sammy squatted down and pulled at the weeds with all his might the ground was hard and the work very tiresome but sammy did not forget how his grandmother had impressed it upon him to do all his work well and willingly at noon the two weeders took their hoes on their shoulders and sammy had to pull the cart which was now much heavier than on the way there the boy had to use all his strength for stophy showed him plainly that he would not take upon himself the larger part of the work then when they passed by the field the father indicated to each one the piece he would have to weed that afternoon for he himself would be obliged to go to the cattle market they would find a smaller hoe at home for sammy to take with him in the afternoon for pulling up the weeds was too slow work after the boys had worked several hours in the afternoon they sat down in the shade of an old apple tree to eat their luncheon and the piece of black bread with pear juice tasted very good after the hot work have you ever seen a bear asked stophy of sammy he said he had not then you would be fearfully frightened if you should suddenly see one continued stophy only those who know them are not afraid of them this evening there is to be one in the village and as i am almost through with my piece in the field you can finish it so i can go early to see the bear sammy agreed when all four had begun to hoe again stophy soon exclaimed well you won't have much more to do now sammy but keep your promise or stophy doubled up his fist and sammy understood what that meant he had hardly gone when michael said see sammy there isn't much left of mine you can do that too i am going to see the bear whereupon michael ran off me too cried uli throwing down his hoe you could finish that also sammy when the twilight came on and the family put the sour milk and the steaming potatoes on the table sammy was missing i suppose he will keep us waiting remarked the farmer's wife sharply when all had finished and the milk mugs were empty the woman cleared them away and placed the few potatoes left over on the kitchen table and growled he can eat here if he wants anything it was quite dark and sammy still had not come just as the other three were being sent to bed he came in so tired he could hardly stand the woman asked him harshly if he couldn't come home with the others the farmer assumed that the piece he had told sammy to weed had been too much for him to do and he said consolingly it is right that you wanted to finish your work but you must work faster sammy understood the signs which stophy made behind his father's back that he was to keep silent about the bear and he was too much afraid of the three boys fists to say anything about it he preferred to go straight to bed for he was too tired to eat but he couldn't go to sleep he had received so many new impressions he had borne so much anguish and had to do so much work besides 
he could think of nothing else but now his grandmother came before his eyes again as she had prayed with him at evening and had been so kind to him and everything she had told him he wanted so much to pray it seemed to him as if his grandmother was near and told him the dear lord would always comfort him if he prayed and that comfort he was so anxious to have he was so troubled when he wondered if he could do his work the next day so that the farmer would not be cross and how his wife would be for he was very much afraid of her and how it would be with the boys who forced him to make everything appear contrary to the truth then sammy began to pray and prayed for a long time for he already began to feel comforted because he could take refuge with the dear lord and ask him to help him now that he had no one left in the world to whom he could speak and who could assist him when at last his eyes closed from the great weariness he dreamed he was sitting with his grandmother on the wall and above them all the birds were singing so loud and so joyfully Chapter Four of What Sammy Sings with the Birds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What Sammy Sings with the Birds by Johanna Spirey. Chapter Fourth Hard Times. The following morning, Sammy was awakened by loud tones, but it was no longer the birds singing, it was the farmer's wife ordering the boys harshly to get up right away. She had already called them three times, and if this time they didn't obey, their father would come. Then they all sprang out of bed, and in a few minutes were downstairs, where their father was already sitting at the table and would not have waited much longer. The day did not pass very differently from the one before, and thus passed a long series of days. There was already a change in the work. Sammy, little by little, learned to do everything very well, for he took pains and followed his grandmother's advice carefully. He always had something to do for the other boys still, so that he never finished his work a moment before supper-time, but he was no longer late. A change had also come about in this. Stophy had learned that there was one thing Sammy could not or would not do which he himself could do very well. He could not tell a lie. He had been late again a couple of times, but had never told the reason. Finally, however, the farmer had spoken harshly now speak out and tell why you can't get through your work faster you are quick enough when any one is watching you then sammy had accordingly told all the truth and the father had threatened to beat the boys if they didn't do their work themselves afterwards stophy had thrashed sammy to punish him and had warned him that he would do it every time sammy complained of him Sammy had replied that he had never complained and didn't want to do so, but when his father questioned him, he could only tell him the truth. Stophy tried to explain to him that it didn't matter whether he told the truth or not, but here he found Sammy more obstinate than he had expected, and no matter what fearful threats he hurled at him, he always said the same thing in the end. But I shall do it. This firmness was the result of Sammy's sure conviction that the dear Lord heard and knew everything, and that lying was something wicked which did not please him. So Stophy had to find some other way to get off from his work early and make Sammy finish what he left. He found that all three could never dare abandon their work and leave it for Sammy, but one of them might do so each evening, and he threatened to punish his brothers severely if they would not agree to this. Then there would always be three or four evenings in succession when Stophy wanted to go away early. Then the brothers had to stay and work, and this led to many a quarrel with heavy blows which regularly fell upon Sammy. So he never had any happy days. But every evening he could be alone with his thoughts of his grandmother, of all the beautiful bygone days and all the good words she had spoken to him. Nobody troubled him or called to him or pulled him then, as usually happened all day long. Thus the summer and autumn passed away, and a cold winter had come. There was no more work to be done in the fields and meadows, but there were all sorts of things to be done to help the farmer in the barn and his wife in the house and the kitchen. This Sammy had to do. 
Meanwhile, their own three boys could go to school, which had now begun again, for they had to get some education. Sammy could get that by and by. In the summer he had acquired a good deal of quickness, and now did his work so skillfully that the farmer said a couple of times, I would not have believed it, for in the summer he was always the last. Sammy now thought that everything would go easier than in the summer, but something came which was much harder to bear than the extra burden of work, which was too much for the others. Every day the boys fought in the field outside, and Sammy, as the smallest, always came off with the most blows, but that was the end of it, and when the boys came home at night, no one thought any more about it. In the evening the three boys were assigned to the little room with the feeble light of a low oil lamp to do their arithmetic for school, while Sammy had to cut apples and pears for drying. From the first the three were angry because Sammy had no arithmetic to do, and then one would accuse the other of taking the light away from him, and all three would scream that Sammy didn't need any at all for his work. Then one would pull the lamp one way, and another the other way, until it was upset and the oil would run over the table into Sammy's apples. Then there would be a really murderous tumult in the darkness. All hands would grope in the oil, and one would always outcry the others. Then the mother would come in, very cross, and want to know who was always starting such mischief. Then one would blame the other, and finally the blame would fall on Sammy, because he made the least noise. Usually the farmer, too, came in then, and his angry wife would always reply that she had indeed said the boy would be an apple of discord in the house, and a winter like this they had never experienced. Often Sammy had to endure many hard words and undeserved punishment. On such evenings he remained sleepless for a long time sitting on his bed. Then he would rack his brains as to how it could happen so, since his grandmother had told him that if he was God-fearing everything would happen for the best that he should be so scolded and badly treated was not the best for him. He really wanted to be God-fearing, and not forget that the dear Lord saw and heard everything. But Sammy was still very young and could not know, what he later knew, that it is good for everyone if he learns early in life to bear hardship. Then when the evil days, which none escape, come again later on, he can cope with them bravely, because he knows them already, and his strength has become hardened and when the good days come he can enjoy them as no one else can who has never tasted the bad ones at this time sammy knew nothing about this and almost never went to sleep without tears indeed he often wondered whether the birds were still calling up in the ash trees only trust in the dear lord and if it were still true that everything would come out right the only comfort for him was that his grandmother had told him so positively and he held fast to that it was a long, hard winter. The snow lay so deep and immovable on the meadows and trees that Sammy often asked with anxiety in his heart if it would ever entirely disappear so that the meadows would be green again and the flowers become alive. It was already April, and the cold, white covering of snow still lay all around. Then a warm wind from the south blew all one night into the valley, and when on the next day a very warm rain fell, the obstinate snow melted into great brooks. Then came the sun and dried up all the brooks, and everywhere the new young grass sprang up over the meadows. The four boys came across the big street of the village and turned into the meadow. They were pulling along the cart on which lay the cooking utensils which the farmer's wife had just purchased at the annual fair in the village. The boys had followed their mother's command to go slowly and carefully so that nothing would be broken for they knew very well that their mother set great store by these things, and it was worth while to follow her instructions. Now that they had come safely over the rough street, and had turned into the meadow road, two pulling, two pushing, they wanted to rest a little while. They stopped under the first large pear tree, stretched themselves out on the ground, and looked up into the blue sky. In the pear tree above, the birds were singing merrily together, and suddenly one piped up in the midst of the others, always the same note, exactly as if he had a special call to give. "'There he is!' cried Sammy, springing up from the ground with delight. Then he listened again, and again sounded the staccato call, clear and sharp above the singing of all the other birds. "'Do you hear it? Do you hear it?' cried Sammy in his delight. "'Now he is calling again. 
trust, 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 trust. And then they all sing together, only trust in the dear Lord. You are just talking nonsense, exclaimed Stofy to the happy Sammy. The bird is more knowing than you are. That is the rain bird. I know him well. He notices the rain wind and is calling shower, shower, shower. Then we know it is going to rain. But Sammy would not give up what was so dear to him and kept saying to himself, but he is singing trust, 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 trust. Keep quiet, continued Stofy sharply to him. You are nothing but a little tramp who can't do anything and doesn't know anything and twists everything he hears. Then the blood rose to Sammy's cheeks, and the tears came into his eyes, and more courageously than usual towards Stofy, he cried, I don't do that, but you have done it many times. Then Stofy sprang up and seized hold of Sammy to throw him down. But in his anger, Sammy turned quite differently from usual, so that Stofy had to call the others to help him. The great struggle ensued. The blows became more and more violent, first on one side and then on the other. Suddenly the cart was upset. A fearful cracking and crashing sounded, and a great heap of red, brown, and white crockery lay on the ground. Dumb with fright, the boys stood and looked at the destruction. Stofy was the first to recover himself. We will say that a wheel came off the cart, and it suddenly fell down. He immediately picked up a big stone in order to pound out the nail and take the wheel off from the axle. I shall say just how it all happened, that we quarreled and upset the wagon, said Sammy, calmly. Then Stofy's wrath rose to its height. You traitor, you spy and mischief-maker, he screamed. You are nothing but a ragamuffin. We will force you. You cannot, said Sammy, and you are no good either. If you were God-fearing, you would not want to lie so. Well, well, they all screamed together and shaking their fists in the most threatening way. You needn't say that. We are just exactly as God-fearing as you, and even much more so. Suddenly a new thought came to Stofy. He ran off with all his might, and Michael and Uli rushed after him. Sammy saw that they were hurrying to the house. He followed slowly after. The farmer's wife had come back to the house by a shorter way, and the farmer was just returning home, too, from the field. When the three boys came rushing along, the whole family was standing in great excitement at the door, and all were talking loudly together and making threatening gestures when Sammy came along. He was met by the farmer, shaking his fist, and his wife threw such harsh words at him that he stood quite dumbfounded. "'That was the last straw,' she said, "'that after all the kindness he had received he should tell them they were not God-fearing people.' Then the farmer joined in. Such talk was insolent from Sammy, and it had been known for a long time how upright they were in his house, before such a scamp had come there and tried to show them the way. Then his wife began again and said Sammy would have nothing more to do in her house, for he had brought nothing but trouble since he stepped into it. He could go to his room, and she would come right along. Sammy was so surprised and confused by all the attacks and charges that he had stood quite dumb until now. Now he wanted to explain how the cart had been upset, but the father said they knew everything already, and all he had to do was to go to his room. He obeyed. Soon the farmer's wife came upstairs, packed Sammy's things together, and tied them up again into a bundle, which was now much smaller than when he had brought it there, for some pieces of his old things had been worn out and were not replaced, and his grandmother's clothes were no longer there. While she was packing, the woman kept on talking very angrily about Sammy's wickedness and insolence, so that he now for the first time understood it all. The boys had stated that he had reproached them for not being God-fearing people, they had punished him for it, and through his resistance he had overturned the cart. Sammy now tried to explain to the woman that it had not happened so, but she said she knew enough, threw his tied-up bundle beside his bed, and went out. Now for the first time Sammy was able to think over what had happened to him and what was going to come. Then he was angry because he had to bear such injustice and not once have a chance to speak. And now he was driven out or perhaps he would be sent to people where it would be even worse for him. Then he was so overcome with anger and fear and anguish that he began to cry aloud and called out, Yes, yes, grandmother, you said if I was God-fearing everything would happen to me for the best, and I have been, and now it has happened this way. But with the thought of his grandmother, 
there rose in his heart all the memories of his life with her how they had wandered so peacefully through the meadows and how beautiful it had been under those trees how the birds had sung and the brook murmured and suddenly sammy was mightily overcome and he exclaimed away away over there over there from that moment on a bright light rose in his heart it was hope in a new life as beautiful as the Chapter 5 of What Sammy Sings with the Birds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What Sammy Sings with the Birds by Johanna Spirey. Chapter 5 The Birds Are Still Singing. The next morning, when Sammy sat at the table with the family, no one said a word to him. The farmer's wife pushed a piece of bread towards his coffee cup and made up an unfriendly face. The farmer was no different. The three boys looked sourly down at their coffee cups, for they had no good consciences, and all three feared that their lies of the day before might yet be found out, if Sammy should happen to speak. When they rose from the table, the farmer said shortly, "'Get your bundle. I shall have to lose more time with you until I have found a place for you, for surely no one will want you.' Since the night before, a change had taken place in Sammy he no longer hung his head as he had done almost always before from fear he lifted it up and said i know already where i must go the farmer and his wife looked at each other in astonishment i want to go over the mountains he added yes that is best that he should go back there where he came from said the farmer's wife quickly there will no doubt be someone going over there from the inn go quickly with him up there this seemed right to leave the farmer also the leave-taking was as short as possible and sammy was light-hearted when he started with his little bundle on his back away from his cousin's house at the end sure enough they found a driver who was going with a big wood wagon to chateau d'eau he was ready to take the boy with him and thought he would be able to find some one to take him farther if the boy knew his way down there on the french side the farmer said Sammy had been brought up there and wanted to go back. He knew where. Now the driver was ready. Sammy's bundle was thrown into the wagon and the boy seated on it. Good luck, said the farmer, gave Sammy his hand and went away. Then the driver swung himself up on his seat and the two strong horses started off. Although the wood wagon was far less handsome and easy than the coach in which Sammy had come, Still, he sat much happier in his hard seat than when he had left his grandmother lying so alone and had to go away, without knowing where. Now he was going home, where he knew everything, and where everything was dear to him, every tree and every wall, by the way, and although he wouldn't see his grandmother any longer, he would find all the places where he had been with her, and where it was more beautiful than anywhere else. With these thoughts, a multitude of questions arose in Sammy's mind. Would everything be still the same as before? Would the ash trees still be standing there by the wall, and the red and yellow flowers be growing on the hillside? And Sammy had so much to think about that he didn't notice how the time was passing, so he was very much astonished when the wagon stopped, for they had come to a large village, and the driver took firm hold of him lifted him up and set him down on the street sammy looked around him they had stopped in front of an inn above which a big brown bear stood for a sign and which was surrounded by all kinds of vehicles but he couldn't look around any longer for the driver had already seized him again and lifted him together with his bundle into another team and then went away soon he came back with a large piece of bread and said there eat you still have far to go. Are we yet in Chateau d'Eau? asked Sammy. Yes, to be sure, but you are going farther, was the reply. Then the driver disappeared. Sammy was now sitting in a small country wagon to which an enormous horse was harnessed. No one was as yet up in the high seat, but Sammy was seated with his bundle back in the empty space on the floor. 
then two big stout men climbed up on the high seat and they started away after a short time sammy's eyes closed involuntarily he slipped off on the floor of the wagon his head fell over on his bundle and he sank into a deep sleep when he woke again he was still in the wagon on the floor but everything was quiet around him he did not hear the horse trotting the wagon was no longer moving forward it looked very strange all around him he looked and looked again until he realized what had happened the wagon was standing without horse or driver in a shed they had forgotten sammy and left him lying there where can i be sammy asked himself the door of the shed stood open and outside there was bright sunshine sammy climbed down from his sleeping place stepped outside and went a little way farther around the house which stood directly in front of the shed then he knew everything about it there stood the house with the garden where he had taken the beautiful coach right before him was the railway station he was an eagle again only a little way farther in the train and he would be at home then it came to sammy that here he could no longer talk with the people for now he was among the french but he knew what to do he still had the little bag with his grandmother's money he ran to the place where the people were getting their tickets laid a piece of money in front of the little window and said la tour immediately he had his ticket he sprang into the train which was already standing outside and crouched down quickly in his corner the very same corner where he had sat before with herr milan he knew all the names which were called out at the station nearer and nearer he came now latour he jumped down and ran to the right across the fields then to the left up the hill he knew every tree along the way now there stood the wall there stood the ash trees and their tops were waving to and fro underneath the clear brook was murmuring and above on the hillside the bright sun was shining on the big golden primroses and the red anemones it was all exactly as it had been before moreover above oh that was the most beautiful of all up in the ash trees the birds were piping and singing as loudly and as merrily as ever and to be sure there was the chief singer the finch trust 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 sounded his clear song and all the birds joined in with their warbling and rejoiced loudly only trust in the dear lord sammy was so overcome because everything was still exactly the same as he had known it before that he stood speechless for a long time and listened looking around him and listening again it seemed so good to him and he had never felt such happiness in his heart since that evening when he had sat there with his grandmother now his grandmother rose so vividly before him that he suddenly threw himself down on the wall and wept she was no longer there and would come back to him no more but all the good words she had spoken to him here that evening rose vividly in his heart and it seemed as if he distinctly heard her talking again and as if she must really be quite near and see him sammy straightened himself up again sat a while longer listening and then began to think what he should do at first he wanted to go to milan and ask him if he could work for him perhaps get out the weeds in his vineyard but he could not explain to him why he was there again they would not understand each other and milan might think he had done something wrong and had been sent away for it by his cousin but perhaps the woman who always gave mending to his grandmother would set him to work in her garden she lived down below near the lake he jumped down from the wall once more he looked at the hillside and up into the tree but he could come here again he was here and could stay here on the way he thought how he could explain to the woman what he wanted to do for her he would bend down and show her how he could pull up the weeds then he would show her by a gesture that he knew how to hoe there stood already the old castle of latour before him with its two high weather-beaten towers which he had looked at so many times all around and high up thick ivy covered the old walls and above them multitudes of merry birds were chirping sammy had to stop and listen to their happy singing for a while 
Then he went along by the high old wall around the courtyard, for he wanted to see if it was still the same as before down below in the lonely place, where the water kept falling on the old stones and singing a gentle song. He had once stood there a long time with his grandmother. There lay the place before him, but it was not lonely. A big wagon was standing there, with a gray cover stretched over it. No horse stood in front of it, but a thin nag was nibbling the hedge, and this evidently belonged to the wagon. Near the old castle tower a fire was blazing merrily. A man was sitting by it, hammering with all his might. Close by him four little children were crawling around on the ground. Sammy stood still at this unexpected sight, then came slowly a little nearer. Then he heard the man warning the children not to come so near the fire. This he was doing in Sammy's own language, exactly as all the people in Suisimon had spoken. This gave courage to Sammy. He came along quite near and watched the man mend a hole in an old pan. "'Does it please you?' asked the man, after Sammy had looked on attentively for some time. The boy answered by nodding his head. "'Are you French, that you can't talk?' asked the man again. Sammy said he could talk, but not at all in French. But he was glad that the tinker spoke German, because otherwise he would not be able to understand anyone there. "'Whom do you belong to?' asked the man again. "'Nobody,' answered Sammy. Then the man wanted to know where he had come from, and why he had come among the French. Sammy told him his history, and how he had only come there again that morning. "'And now don't you know at all what you are going to do, and where you are going?' asked the man. Sammy said he did not. "'If I knew that you would do something, and not just stand around and look in the air, I would give you work.' continued the man. But such stray waifs as you are not willing to do anything. Meanwhile, a woman had come from the wagon. She had heard her husband's last words. Take him, she said. What work is there for him? He might run errands. All boys can do that. I never get through with the running about and the four ballers and the cooking besides. Take him. Well, stay here, said the man. You can carry the pan back. It is very good that you know the way. Sammy had suddenly found a place. He did not himself know how, but he was very glad about it. Quite content, he started out with his pan, and did exactly as the tinker had told him. He wandered through the long street of Latour, went into every house, and showed his mended pan. He made significant gestures to make the people understand that he would like to get more articles to mend. This he did so eagerly and earnestly that most of the people burst out laughing, and this put them in such good humor that they always found a pan or a kettle with a hole in it, which they handed him, to be repaired. Thus, in a short time, Sammy had collected as much old stuff as he was able to carry, and could now take his pan to the house pointed out to him where it belonged. Then he turned back. The tinker was very much pleased with Sammy's harvest, and his wife said very kindly, if he kept on doing like that, he would get along all right, but he must sit down at once and have some supper. The four little children were no longer there. Sammy guessed that they were lying out in the wagon asleep. On the fire a pot was now standing. It was bubbling merrily inside, and from under the cover came forth a very inviting odor. Sammy had never been so hungry in his life before for he had had nothing the whole day but the rest of the piece of bread which the driver had given him the day before in Chateau d'Eau. The woman took the cover off the pot and filled three dishes with the good-smelling soup. Each of the three now placed his dish before him on the ground, and the meal began. Nothing had ever tasted so good to Sammy in all his life as this soup. It was not a thin soup. It was as thick as pulp, of cooked peas and potatoes, and with this quite large lumps of meat came into his spoon. When he had finished, the woman said, "'You can go to sleep whenever you want to. In the back of the wagon there is room, and your bundle will make a good pillow.' This seemed a little strange to Sammy, and he said, "'Must I sleep in my clothes?' The woman thought he would find that he would not be too warm in the night. He would be ready all the sooner in the morning.' Then he could wash his face quickly down in the lake and be all in order again for the next day. Sammy was tired. 
he went immediately to the wagon and climbed up from the back and was able to slip in under the big cover there was a little room where he could lie down and next him came the four little children one after another sammy sat down and said his evening prayer then he thought of his grandmother for a while and what she would say if she could see him thus in the wagon and know that he would have to sleep all the time in his clothes and if only she could see how it looked in the wagon so dirty and in disorder she had been so neat and orderly about everything and had kept him so clean from a baby up but she had never spoken to him about this as about other things which he must avoid and perhaps the people were quite god-fearing then he ought to stay with them that would be as his grand Chapter Six of What Sammy Sings with the Birds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What Sammy Sings with the Birds, by Johanna Spirey. Chapter Sixth. Sammy Sings Too. Sammy had now been working five days for the tinker and had passed his nights in the wagon. He was well treated, for the man and his wife were pleased with him. Every day Sammy dragged along such a pile of old pans, pots, and kettles that they both wondered where he found them. His grandmother had not charged him in vain to do everything he had to do as well as he possibly could, because the dear Lord always saw what he was doing. He never loitered on the way, and if a woman was going to send him away quickly and would not listen to him, then he looked at her so beseechingly that she would find an old pan somewhere and bring it out. From morning till night he ran with the greatest zeal, in order to get as much work as possible for his master, and the praise he won every evening he enjoyed as much as the savory soup which followed. Nevertheless, Sammy was not very well contented. Every evening, as he sat in the wagon, he had to think what his grandmother would say to all the dirt around him, and things pleased him less and less. The woman did not do for the little children as his grandmother had done for him, all four crawled around in the dirt and looked so that Sammy didn't care to have anything to do with them. If they cried, they were knocked this way and that, and at night the woman took up one after another from the ground, put it in the wagon, pulled the dirty gray blanket over them, and went away again. The largest boy could talk quite well. He could have learned a little prayer long before this, but the woman never taught him any. Such a homesickness for his grandmother now arose in Sammy's heart every evening that he had to bury his head deep in his bundle, so that no one would hear him sob. Often on his expeditions he would come near the wall, under the ash-trees, but he never went over to it, for he had to work and did not dare sit idle and listen to the birds. But every time he had looked longingly there, and sent a whistle from a distance as greeting to the birds. From the old house on the hillside, from which one could look down at the ash-trees and the wall, he had brought a little kettle to the tinker, and was delighted at the thought of taking it back again, for then he could look down there for a moment, and perhaps hear the birds. Two days had passed, and Sammy hoped that on the following day the little kettle would be ready. When he returned that evening to the fire with his last collection, the tinker was sitting thoughtfully there, turning the little kettle round and round in his hands, his wife was looking over his shoulders, and both were scrutinizing the old kettle as if it were something unusual. "'It is as like the other as if it were its brother,' said the wife. "'You know how the man said you must not spoil the pictures scratched on it, and on that account he gave you so much more for it. Here are exactly the same figures on this, and the nose in front has just the same curve as the other.' which he would not have mended for fear it would be spoiled. "'I see it all, surely,' said the man. "'But I don't know what can be done about it. With the other one, I could say, it couldn't be mended any more, for it looked much worse than this, and the people didn't know that the old stuff was worth anything, and I wouldn't have believed it was myself.' "'They won't know either. The boy brought the kettle from the old house up there. They only know the ground they hoe.' but not such a thing as this. 
just say it can't be mended any more it is not good for anything and give them something for the copper they will be satisfied enough if we go back to burn we will take it to the man who will give eighty francs for it that is true we can do that said the man delighted perhaps they won't want anything for the kettle when they know they can't use it any more come sammy he called to the boy who stood staring at them on the other side of the fire and had heard and understood everything come here i want to tell you something sammy obeyed run quickly up to the old house where you brought the little kettle from and say it isn't good for anything that it can't be mended any more sammy filled with horror stared at the man now hurry up and go along said his wife who was still standing there you understand well enough what you have to do sammy continued looking at the man without moving as if he really had not understood his words what is the matter with you why don't you hurry along snarled the man to him i can't do that you are not god-fearing if you do such a thing as that said sammy what is it to you what i do be quick and go along commanded the tinker and his wife screamed angrily do you think a little beggar like you is going to tell us what is god-fearing we ought to know much better than you will you do at once what you are told or not sammy did not stir will you go and do what i told you or the man raised his hand high up sammy was pale with fright suddenly he turned around ran to the wagon took his bundle out and ran with all his might up the road turned to the right between the high walls and rushed on into the open field not a moment did he stop running until he had reached the ash trees the spot was like a place of refuge to him breathless he sat down on the wall the twilight was already coming on and it was perfectly still all around no one had run after him as he feared he was quite alone now he began to think it was all done so quickly that he had only now come to his senses yes it was right that he had run away for what he had to do was something wrong and he had to come away because they were not god-fearing it surely would seem right to his grandmother that he had done this but where should he go now the people had all gone home from the fields perhaps were already asleep up in the ash trees not one little bird made a single sound they were surely all in their nests and fast asleep if the dear lord kept them up there in the trees safe from all harm so that they could sleep so well he would surely protect him too under the trees in this spot he always had the feeling that his grandmother was nearer to him than anywhere else and this gave him confidence so he laid himself down under the tree quite trustfully and immediately after he had ended his evening prayer his eyes closed for the brook was murmuring such a beautiful slumber song under the ash trees there golden sunshine was streaming in sammy's eyes when he awoke above him all the birds were warbling their morning song up into the blue sky it sounded like pure thanksgiving and delight it awakened in sammy's heart the same tones and he had to sing praise and thanksgiving for the dear lord had protected him too so well through the night and let his golden sunshine on him again with a clear voice sammy joined in the glad chorus and sang a hymn of praise and thanksgiving the only one he knew last night summer breezes blew all the flowers awake anew and when he had come to the end he sang like the merry finch with all his might trust 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 only trust the dear lord the song had awakened in sammy new assurance that he would find a piece of bread and some worthy work this he wanted to look for now for his grandmother had not impressed it upon him in vain from his earliest days that in the morning after praying one should immediately go to work so sammy started off he did not go down to the lake this day lest he should come near the tinker with his bundle under his arm he wandered up the gradually rising field road where this crossed the narrow street leading over to clarence sammy met a child's carriage which a girl was pushing in front of her she wore a spotless white cap and a white apron over the carriage too was spread a snow-white cover and out from under it peeped a little head with bright golden hair and a little white hat on it this unusual neatness and the smart appearance of the carriage attracted sammy very much and he followed along the same way on the white carriage robe was worked a wreath of blue silk but not of flowers it was of strange figures 
The shining blue silk on the white cloth looked so beautiful that Sammy could not keep his eyes away from it. Suddenly it became plain to him that the strange figures were letters, but he had never seen anything like them in his life. Their appearance captivated him more and more. Then he began to try to see if he couldn't spell them out and perhaps read the words. He tried as hard as he could, but it was difficult. Sammy kept beginning over again from the first. Finally he made out all the words. It was a proverb which read thus, So let the little angel sing, This child is safe beneath our wing. This proverb reminded him so much of his grandmother, he didn't know why, but it seemed to him as if she had prayed exactly like this over his bed. The tears came to his eyes, and yet it seemed so good, just as if he had found his home again. The girl now turned suddenly to the left from the road, and went through the high iron gate, which stood open and led into a wide courtyard. Great ancient plane trees stood inside and cast their broad shade over the sunny courtyard. A large flower garden surrounded the high stone house, which looked forth from behind the trees. Sammy followed the carriage into the courtyard. It stopped under the trees. "'What do you want here? That is the way out,' said the girl impatiently to Sammy, pointing so plainly to the gate that Sammy would have understood the meaning of her words, even if her language had been foreign. But it was surely German, and he had understood it all very well. Although he could not speak like that himself, his grandmother had told him that there were people who spoke just like the reading in the books. Sammy did not reply, and the girl did not wait for him. She snatched the child quickly out of the carriage, took the beautiful robe over her arm, and went into the house. Meanwhile a little girl had come out of the house and was standing at some distance gazing at Sammy with two big eyes. Now she came quickly forward, jumped nimbly into the empty carriage, and said, "'Come, give me a ride.' "'Where?' asked Sammy. "'Out there along the road, and far, far away.' Sammy obeyed immediately. For a long while he trotted along, without stopping. The little girl seemed to enjoy the ride. She looked so eagerly around with her bright eyes on every side, as if she couldn't see enough. Then they came to a meadow thick with flowers. "'Hold still, hold still!' cried the little one suddenly, and sprang with a big jump out of the low carriage. "'Now we must have all the flowers, every single one. Come!' And the little girl was already in the midst of the grass, stamping bravely forward. But Sammy said quite prudently, "'You mustn't go so into the grass. It is forbidden.' But see, if we go around outside and take all the flowers you can reach, there will be a big bunch. The little one came out, for she knew that she ought not to do what was forbidden. Then the flowers were gathered, according to Sammy's advice. But the little companion soon had enough of such exertion, seated herself on the ground, and said, Come, sit down by me, but you must not speak French to me. I have to learn that with Madame Laurent, but I would rather speak German, and you must do so too. I don't speak French. I don't know how, replied Sammy, but I can't speak like you either. Where do you come from, then, if you don't speak German and don't speak French? The little one wanted to know. Sammy thought for a moment. Then he said, First I came from Chile, and then from Suisimin. No, no, interrupted the little one warmly. People are never from two places, only from one. I am from Berlin and Germany, you see. Then Papa bought an estate, and now we are living on Lake Geneva. What is your name? Sammy told her. And my name is Betty. Why did you come into the courtyard when Tina wanted to send you out? Sammy had to think for a while. Then he said, Because those words were on the robe. I knew they were God-fearing people where it belonged. And my grandmother told me I must stay with such people and never go away, for I should learn nothing but good from them. "'Must you stay with us now and never go away again?' asked little Betty eagerly. "'Yes, I think so,' answered Sammy. "'Perhaps I can weed the garden.' "'That is right,' said Betty, delighted. "'You see, Tina will not take me in the carriage. She says I am too big. Will you take me every day in the carriage to the meadow for ever so many hours?' "'Yes, indeed. I will do that gladly,' promised Sammy. "'And you shall have all the flowers.' Then I will take you besides to the trees where all the birds sing, only trust the dear Lord, and where the finch cries so loud above them all, trust, 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 trust. Have you heard him too? 
At this description, little Betty's eyes grew bigger and brighter with expectation. "'Come now, let's go right away to the birds!' she exclaimed, jumped up and ran in haste to the carriage. Sammy followed. At this moment Tina, with a very red face, came running up from below. Her looks did not portend anything good. "'So I have found you at last,' she cried angrily from a distance. "'Everybody is running around looking for you. Your three brothers, the servants, the coachman, everybody. I have run myself half dead for you. Sit down in the carriage, you naughty little thing. The little tramp can go where he likes. No, he must come back again. His bundle is lying in the courtyard.' so he can pull the carriage if he has to come with us. Little Betty did not seem very much frightened by this lively speech. She climbed quickly into the carriage and said gaily, "'Go ahead, Sammy!' He obeyed, quite crushed, for now he could only return for his bundle. Then he would have to go away again, and he had so firmly believed this was the place where he was to stay according to his grandmother's advice, and it had pleased him so much." He had started out in the morning, full of trust from the song of the birds, and now he was returning very downhearted the same way. When the three on their way home came to the courtyard, a tall man was standing there, looking out up and down the road. A lady was coming out of the house and going in again very restlessly, and three young boys were running first one way and then another, screaming at the top of their voices, "'She has nowhere to be seen! She has nowhere to be seen!' But there she was, drawn by Sammy, just coming into the courtyard. Before any question, reproach, or accusation could be heard in regard to the unlawful expedition, Betty had run straight to her papa, and in his delight that she was safely there again, he had taken her in his arms, and with the greatest eagerness she said, "'He will take me every day in the carriage, papa, the whole day long, if I like,' and bring all the flowers to me, because I must not go in the high grass. And he must always stay with us, because his grandmother knew about it. And Papa, think, he knows birds that sing a whole song, and the finch sings above them all. Trust, trust. We were going right to see them when Tina came, and we had to come home. But now we can go, can't we, Papa, right away? Sammy will take me there again. He isn't tired yet. Only say yes, Papa." "'Your story is wonderful,' said her papa, laughing. "'Where is the little coachman whom you have engaged, "'and who, according to his grandmother's advice, must stay with us?' "'Meanwhile the three brothers had come running along, "'and together with their mother stood near their father under the gateway, "'so that Sammy, who with his bundle on his arm was trying to go out, "'could not pass through and had betaken himself very quietly to a corner of the courtyard.' The master of the house now placed his daughter on the ground and looked towards the boy, but he was already surrounded, for during their little sister's story the three brothers had made their examination and calculation, and then had turned to the boy. Nine-year-old Edward had decided with satisfaction that Sammy was the one he had for a long time needed, for since the donkey, which had been given to him at Christmas, had overturned him and his little cart three times running, his father had forbidden him to drive out again without the coachman, Johann. But when Edward wanted to go out driving, Johann was always occupied some other way, and when Johann announced that he could go, it didn't suit Edward at all. Now Sammy was found, an attendant whom he could call whenever he wanted him. Eleven-year-old Carl was an enthusiastic archer, but to have to be always running after his arrows, after they were shot, and to hunt for them, was very irksome to him. Suddenly someone was found whom he could make use of to hunt for his arrows. Fourteen-year-old Arthur had permission to sail his boat on the lake, but he needed someone to steer for him. Now here was a satisfactory boy on the spot whom he could teach and have to steer for him. So it happened that there was a great uproar when their papa drew near the group in the corner of the courtyard. "'Keep him, papa. I have enough work for him to do,' cried Arthur." while Carl's voice was heard above his screaming. "'Let him stay here, Papa. Please, I need him so much!' But Edward's piercing voice was heard above the other two. "'Papa, he can drive the donkey. He must stay with us. Then Johann won't need to come with me any longer.' And in the midst of all sounded Betty's high little voice untiringly. "'Can we go to see the birds now, Papa? Can we go now to the birds?' 
then papa turned away from the noisy group and said laughing my dear wife what do you say to this whole story the lady addressed had until now listened silently and watched sammy whose eyes grew brighter and brighter the louder the children begged for him to stay she looked at him kindly and said first of all she would like to know from him where he came from and what the story which betty told about his grandmother meant he ought to tell where he had been living hitherto who his parents were and who his grandmother was the kind lady had inspired sammy with great confidence and he now told from the beginning all that he knew about his life up to the present moment and also how he had come into the courtyard on account of the proverb which led him to believe that here lived the people with whom he should stay when sammy came to an end the lady turned to her husband and said it is the dear lord who has led him here we cannot send him away the children all shouted together for joy can we go to the birds now papa right away repeated betty with irrepressible eagerness by and by by and by said her father soothingly sammy is going with me first up to chiley to show me where herr milan lives i want to talk with him when we come back we will see what to do first the mother understood that her husband wanted to have herr milan's assurance that everything sammy had told was true and held back the children who all four were anxious to explain immediately to sammy what they desired of him but bring him back again papa cried betty following after them as they started away Herr Milan was very much surprised to see Sammy again, and moreover in such company, for he recognized the master of the plain tree estate at once. After the first greeting, Sammy was sent outdoors for a little, and this delighted him very much, for now he could look at the garden again and the crooked maple tree, under which he had so often sat with his grandmother. Herr Milan assured his guest that all Sammy's words were correct, and besides gave a description of old Marianne her fidelity and conscientiousness, so that the gentleman was very glad to have such good news to carry to his wife. A loud shout of delight welcomed them on their return, and still louder was the applause when their father announced that Sammy was henceforth to remain in the house and be the children's playmate. Sammy did not know what to make of it. Since his grandmother's death, no one had shown the slightest pleasure in his presence. On the contrary, everywhere he had felt— as if he were tolerated only out of pity, and now he was received with loud rejoicing by the children of a house to which he had been more attracted than anywhere else before, and where his grandmother would be glad to see him. Of that he was sure. His heart was so overflowing with joy that he wanted to sing aloud and give praise and thanksgiving ever more like the finch. Trust, trust, only trust the dear Lord! It is now ten years since Sammy entered the plane tree estate. Whoever passes by there on a beautiful spring day will surely stand still at the high iron gateway and listen for a little, for there is seldom heard such a merry song as sounds from the thick branches of the plane trees. Up in the tree sits the young gardener pruning the branches. At the same time he sings continually, like the merriest finch, and carols loudest the end of his song accompanied by all the birds only trust the dear lord the young gardener is sammy at first he received a good knowledge of reading writing and arithmetic with the children of the house later according to his great wish he was trained as a gardener of the estate but he is now not only gardener he has much more to oversee about the estate than any one would imagine arthur who has just finished his studies is still an ardent sailor without sammy no trip is possible and arthur is apt to say without god's help and sammy's assistance i should have been drowned twenty times when carl comes from the university in his vacation his first question is where is sammy and this he asks numberless times every day for without him he can never get ready he alone knows where to find everything Carl needs in vacation time for his amusements, from his old bow and quiver up to his riding whip and gun. Edward has now given up his donkey cart and instead is interested in strange animals, which have their dwelling place in the back of the courtyard and often make a great spectacle there. He owns two marmots, two parrots, and a monkey. 
no one could manage these and keep them in order but sammy and he does it so well and so successfully that edward often exclaims without sammy everything we have would go to ruin animals and people the animals for want of proper care and the people from anger over it but petit still remains sammy's greatest friend she can call him at any hour of the day she pleases sammy is immediately on the spot and betty knows he is more devoted than any one else and besides can keep secrets like a stone no one knows how many little notes he has to carry every week to the neighboring estates sammy will not tell for her brothers would laugh at their sister betty's endless correspondence which she has with numerous girlfriends around on all the estates sammy is her most devoted friend for he would run through fire and water for her without hesitation he never forgets what persuasive words in his behalf betty used with her father when broken-hearted he was going to fetch his bundle and go away again the youngest ella with golden curls who has taken over the donkey and cart from her brother edward is entrusted to sammy's especial care when she desires to go for a drive whenever she brings out her white robe to spread over her knees sammy's eyes sparkle with delight and thankfulness as he remembers how the proverb led him to his good fortune and still more at the memory of his grandmother who brought about all this good and whom he never forgets when recently a lady owning one of the neighboring estates proposed to herr von k to transfer his merry gardener to her merely because the servants in her house had sullen faces he replied you can have him just as much as you can have one of my own children if you should try to entice one away sammy is the most faithful trustworthy conscientious person who has ever come in my way i can leave my whole house and go wherever i will i know that everything will be taken care of as if i stood by this is so because sammy has another master besides me before whose eyes he performs all his work the dear lord himself sent my glad-hearted sammy to me and i esteem him he belongs to my house and it shall remain his home end of chapter six and am